Good afternoon. I will call this meeting of the Housing, Finance, and Policy Committee to order and note that we have a quorum present. Uh, Lee Johnson, have you had a chance to review the minutes from March 26th? Uh, Chair Howard, I reviewed them and I make a motion to approve. Uh, Lee Johnson moves the minutes from March 26th. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the, mo the motion prevails. It's uh, Chair Hassan Day in Minnesota Housing Committee. She, uh, she has three bills. And we're going to start with House File 4169. All right. And I'll note that for all the bills we're hearing today, we're going to lay them over uh, for possible inclusion. So I'll just move that House File 4169 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Uh, Representative Hassan, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon. As you can see, we came prepared today. <laughs> House, file, um, House File 4169 appropriates $35 million one time to Minneapolis Public Housing Authority and its wholly controlled nonprofit organization, Community Housing Resources, to rehabilitate, preserve, equip, and repair deeply affordable housing units. Um, as you guys know, um, you know, Minneapolis Public Housing, most of these housings were built uh, in the 60s and um, have not had any uh, renovations or any funding. Um, and the federal government has been cutting funding every year. Um, and we as a state have not been adding to whatever, we're not making up the gap from the feds to what this uh, housing needs. I happen to have a lot of public housing units in my district, um, you know, and I know this, the, the state that they're in. Um, some of them are falling apart. Some of them need, uh, you know, AC units to be installed. Some of them have a leaky roofs. And uh, many of this housing is family housing units that children are growing up in. Um, and these are families that are, you know, the most needy. Um, I just have, I'll share with you some stats that I, I got from the Minneapolis Housing Authority. Um, and um, the agency maintains, um, you know, this por uh, portfolio is about 700 deeply affordable single family and duplex and fourplex serving about 3,100 people. And of the residents who call these properties home, 87% of them are black, 85% of them are female led, and two thirds of the household uh, of the households have five or more family members, uh, and and are families with children. The agency maintains a wait list of this type of housing, recently exceeding about 7,500 people in that wait list. And the portfolio's current backlog uh, of capital need stood at 31 million dollars last year, and if left unaddressed, um, the need becomes 65 million dollars by 2027. With that, Mr. Chair, I have, um, um, is the mayor or, uh, did, okay, the mayor of um, our city, uh, Mayor Jacob Fry, um, and Abi Warsame, the director, are here to just um, speak on this need and we'll stand for questions. Director Warsame, welcome to the committee. All right, thank you, Representative Hassan. Uh, do you want me to introduce myself? Do I have to? Okay. Please do, uh, and, then, and then begin with your testimony. All right. My name is Abdul Osami. I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. <laughs> thank you, Representative Hassan, and thank you, Chair Howard, and members of the committee for welcoming me to share more about MPHA and how we would deploy uh, this major initiative. Currently, the agency maintains a 33 million capital backlog for its portfolio of 700 plus deeply affordable family homes because of decades of disinvestment from the federal government while these homes were in the agency's public housing portfolio. In 2020, the agency converted these homes to operate on the Section 8 platform through the agency's wholly controlled nonprofit community housing resources or CHR. Through that conversion, MPHA was able to more than double the federal subsidy received for operating these homes. That is important because it allows the agency to invest more money back into the portfolio, but it's still not enough to overcome the capital backlog built up over decades. In fact, absent a large outside capital infusion, the, con the continued operability of these homes is in jeopardy. 
That is why we came before this committee last year seeking a $45 million investment to overcome this capital backlog. While we did not get our full request last year, we did get a $5 million direct appropriation from the legislature. Subsequently, we also secured $1.3 million for Minnesota Housing Shop Program for this work. Coupling the state money with a $3.7 million investment championed by Mayor Fry in the city's 2023 budget, MPHA secured $10 million in outside support for CHR last year. That money is going towards exterior work like replacing leaky roofs, drafty windows, and old siding. It is also financing more extensive deep turns. Think kitchen and bathroom renovations and plumbing and electrical replacement when one family moves out and before the next moves in. I want to thank Chair Howard and this committee for making these unprecedented investments in our city. This committee has made a permanent and lasting impact <coughs> on the lives of nearly 3,100 people living in these homes more than half of whom are children. But our work is not done, and we still need your help to eliminate this capital backlog for good. That is why we are before you again, seeking a 35 million POP cash grant to eliminate the remaining capital backlog. But this money will do more than just provide safe, stable, affordable housing for thousands of families for decades. This money will make more homes ADA accessible. It will deliver energy efficiency, and it will invest in minority-owned, women-owned, and low-income Section 3 businesses. For example, last year, nearly 42% of contracted labor hours for this portfolio were performed by minority-owned businesses. Fi finally, I want to stress that once we get through this accrued backlog, we will be able to maintain these homes for decades, relying solely on the increased federal subsidy we now get. So this isn't give us a bunch of money now and we'll see you in 10 years situation. If we work together to address this now, we will solve this problem for generations. I cannot overstate how transformational this investment would be for the 3,100 residents living in these homes today. Like Representative Hassan said, 88% of whom are black. 86% being female-led households, and nearly two-thirds of households being families of five or more, or young families with children. This would be a life-changing investment for these MPHA families and for the future of our entire region. Thank you again for the opportunity to share these details with you today, and I will now turn it over to Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry, who can speak about what this investment would mean for our city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Mayor Fry, welcome to the committee. Chair Howard, uh, Vice Chair Agbaje, uh, to our, our author, Representative Hassan, uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Of course, uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of HF 4169, which is the MPHA funding bill for $35 million. I want to highlight something that our executive director of MPHA just said, which is with this $35 million investment, from the perspective of the state, we would be done. Uh, MPHA could then rely on federal subsidy going forward, monies that in most cases they already get. This is also money that would be well used. And it's well used because there is a track record at MPHA of making sure that every dollar counts and goes to the right place. Through the uh, CRH uh, funding, CHR funding that he mentioned earlier, uh, this enables us to actually create a scenario where two plus two actually equals five. Uh, you're able to receive more dollars from the federal government. You're able to keep the ownership in a public entity. Uh, you're able to make sure that they have full directional sense about where the money ultimately goes. And you're able to do the necessary rehabilitation work and property management that is so essential. This $35 million goes to that capital backlog, which we've all talked about has been overdue for decades. Once this $35 million, coupled with the city's $5 million ongoing investment is made, again, you've got an opportunity to solve the problem. I mean, how many issues do we all get across a city's desk, across state's desk that are a problem now and will still probably be an issue five years from now? This allows us to help 
the 7,500 people that are presently waiting online to get public housing. This helps the 3,100 people, the families, the young kids that presently rely on public housing. And this helps the countless families that have been graduating at a rate of an average of six years after uh, uh, receiving that public housing to other forms. And I know we've got some people in the audience right now that have done exactly that. Uh, so this is, this is a very important deal. Last year, as I mentioned, uh, the city uh, made a commitment to provide $5 million to uh, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority ongoing. Uh, it's by far the largest investment that our city has ever made. And in fact, several times the, the previous record. We're all in. We believe in this work. Uh, and with $35 million, we can uh, really end the conversation in a really positive light. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mayor. Next, we have Mary McGovern, president of the Minneapolis High Rise uh, Representative Council. Thank you for listening to me. Welcome to the committee. See some familiar faces. Here. Yes, good to see you. <laughs> um, my name is Mary McGovern. I'm president of the Minneapolis High Rise Representative Council and I represent over 5,000 public housing uh, uh, rep residents in Minneapolis. We stand in solidarity with our neighbors and family members living in scattered housing. Can we agree that all people rich, poor, and in between want and de deserve to live in decent, safe, and well-maintained housing? Unfortunately, low-income folks in our state, state and city who depend on public supported housing too often do not actually had the experience of living housing, supported housing, to, um, that is decent, safe, or well-maintained. This is largely because of years of underinvestment and di disinvestment by the federal government and housing for our country's most vulnerable and in need. As a public housing re resident leader, I have heard all too often from local and state officials that public housing is not our problem or responsibility. Well, guess what? The attitude does nothing to help us in helping most vulnerable among us is what we expect of elected officials of all level of government and what we urgently need. The passage of this bill, this historic one-time investment of $35 million to help the MPHA finally make a real dent in its over 229 million backlog of capital needs would show that you understand the role that the state can and should in ensuring all families, all children, truly get to experience decent and safe, well-maintained housing. You'd want nothing less for your own. With this funding, Minnesota would lead the way in showing the importance of state investment in preserving public housing and its commitment to low-income citizens being treated with respect, dignity by local government. I urge you, please support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Last on the list, we have Muna Dahir. And I believe we're gonna have some help with translation. Hi there. My name is Mona Dahir. I'm the reason I came here is I'm a living testimony that um, that I was living in a public housing. I was living in public housing um, around 16 years now. Uh, my family and I, who is uh, my husband and nine kids. I benefited a lot and I'm uh, proud to say that I have been in a home owner right now. I benefited a lot and I'm proud to say that I'm a home owner right now. I am very happy to be part of the public housing, and um, I am the one of the people that um, was helped by the public housing 
to reach the level that I'm at right now. انتي ام غرو كو جيران واحد ايبا كما شيغان ان اد يو دا يعتري جيران وحان او باهدنا سيدا او نقصي ابنا ايبا قبن جيران While I was living in the public housing um, I never had any complaints anything that I requested uh, whether it's maintenance or it, it was on time family matter done هر كان ما انت انسو غارنا ايغا كان كسو غاري ما دينا عم نقضى او نر غرو له ايغا درادو بان كسو غاري And I believe uh, where I'm at right now is because of public housing. Because of uh, without the public housing, I wouldn't be a homeowner. And I'm very happy to be part of that and graduated right now. And thank you. Thank you for being here and for sharing your story. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that wishes to testify? If not, we can go to member discussion. Uh, member discussion. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And before we move forward uh, on this bill and other bills, can you tell me what your target is for the committee? Um, Representative Nash, target for a general fund number is $10 million. $10, $10 million and then debt service uh, to do a $50 million housing infrastructure bonds bill. Okay. Um, so. Representative Hassan, I, I appreciate the need for deferred maintenance. It's a big deal um, and it's important. I just, I want to make sure that as we're talking about this, that we, as I, as I always do, we try to level set expectations. The uh, chair just shared that we have a $10 million or he's got $10 million to work with. It's a $35 million. Can you do something, anything with a smaller amount that's likely going to be um, appropriated, if at all? Mr. Chair. Representative Hassan. Um, Mr. Chair and Rep. Nash, um, any bill that we bring here is scalable, um, and I'm sure, you know, I don't want to speak for Minneapolis uh, Public Housing. I wanted the director to actually answer that question, but I, I believe that any support that um, they get, this is the need that, <coughs> that they have, and any support that they will get, they will uh, take it. Um, Ms. Abdi? Okay. And yeah, you can answer, yeah, come on. And I'll just share, I think it's entirely appropriate for bills that sort of highlight that need to be before us, but thanks for uh, bringing, there, the needs are greater than our target, there's no doubt. But uh, yep. please please state your name for the record and, and share with your testimony. Yep, um, Drew Hallnan uh, from Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. Um, I can answer that question. In short, yes. We have, you know, the $33 million of needs on this portfolio, and any amount helps. Last session, you know, we came with a $45 million ask. We got five. We deployed, we're deploying that right now. We coupled that with city money, short money from Minnesota Housing. So, yes, we, this is a shovel-ready project. We know what's got to be done. So any amount of additional funds that we can get from state, local support, we're ready to go on it. Representative Dotson. Thank you, Chair Howard, uh, Representative. Question I've got is, uh, you know, I'm a little bit new to uh, some of these different programs that we're experiencing here. What I'm seeing is a lot of uh, public housing in need, uh, which I appreciate your, your, your ask of uh, trying to help improve it, but who's been managing these programs up to this point? Because isn't there normally a, I guess a normal investor would actually have a money set aside for future uh, repairs, et cetera. Was there a plan in place for that or how did we get here, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Hey, Representative Hassan. Mr. Chair, Rep. Datsa. Um, so I think I, I stated in my opening uh, statement that uh, the federal government has been, uh, you know, decreasing the funding for this this uh, type of housing. So this we didn't get here overnight. This has been years of disinvestment and underinvestment, and um, the state hasn't stepped up to, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe you know, close the gap between what the federal government has been funding and the shortfall in that funding, but we also have the director here who can uh, say more on that. Um, I, I missed the question, but I think you're talking about the capital backlog and, and why we got, how we got there. How we got here. Yeah, yeah. So we get, we usually get, for the last 30 years, public housing authorities were getting 10 cents for every dollar they need for capital, uh, to, to keep up with capital needs. And that has become for us MPHA has around 50% of the entire states for public housing and HRA's capital backlog, which is, which is now estimated around $225 million. This portfolio we're talking about is our family housing. And what we did in 2020 is we moved it from the Section 9 platform, which is public housing, to the Section 8 platform. And the reason why we moved 
this portfolio to the Section 8 platform is because the Section 8 platform gets fully funded by the federal government because it's a platform that has a lot of private uh, landlords and, and, and a larger political advocacy. So by moving it from Section 9 to Section 8, we actually doubled the subsidy that we get f from the previous platform. So it's the same housing, the same staff, the same residents. We just created a nonprofit because we had to create it to, to get the Section 8 subsidy. And because we got the Section 8 subsidy, now we can build reserves over time. So we can build reserves uh, that can help us with the cap keep up with capital backlog. The problem that what we hear is the previous 30 years capital backlog, which is around 33 million. If we take care of that, this portfolio, our family housing portfolio, stays sustainable for the foreseeable future because we can build the reserves because we're getting a lot more subsidy through the Section 8 platform. Representative Dotson. Thank you, Chair Howard. Uh, thank you for your uh, your response on that. Is there, I, I guess, a follow-up question on that would be, is there, is there a reason why the federal government has backed away from funding some of these programs? Is there a new program that they're directing it towards? Or what's the reasoning for this, I guess? I mean, the reason is it's multifaceted, but the main thing would be is politics. Um, public housing was seen for a long time to be, you know, marginalized poor people for whatever reason. Um, they were not a priority, and he didn't have a big voice because you're part of the government. You're just basically part of HUD. The Section 8 platform is different because a lot of private landlords get Section 8 vouchers so they can call their senators and their Congress folks and make a lot of noise, and that's why the Section 8 platform has always gets 100% funding, while the public housing platform gets about 80% or even less. And so it's more mainly political. And I can actually you know, add one thing. There was an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago that talked about the city of Paris, a large city in Europe, one of the largest cities in the world, and they fully fund their public housing. And they were actually using an example saying, look what Paris does, and look how much their public housing is in good shape, um, you know, is embedded into the other housing, it works, it's less uh, you know, segregated. So there are examples where public housing could be fully funded and supported. Ours, unfortunately, is not. One, one more follow-up question. With this being Section 9 housing now, is there a management fee that goes in place as far as uh, who manages the monies and how do we make sure that there's accounting for those monies? Uh, we, we, we run our programs and we are one of the, you know, in terms of, if you're talking about us, we run our programs. So it's the same uh, folks that have run it in the past. And we do very well. For example, HUD has metrics. They measure us every year. They do inspections. And last year we scored 98.5% over, over a scale of 100 so we know how to manage money. We've, we've managed it. We have 98% occupancy rate, right, in, in, in all of our housing pro pro projects. But the problem is we don't get enough resources, and that's why we've come to the state to say that this key infrastructure in the city of Minneapolis, which takes care of 5% of the city's population, should be, you know, taken care of. One Re Representative final, Yeah, one final comment would be uh, uh, with the public housing, I, I've, or with the uh, public housing, I'm seeing a lot more push towards that direction. Are there other programs if this were more privatized where it was uh, private individuals that own these facilities and manage it where they're responsible for setting aside a budget to maintain and repair and still allow uh, low-income housing? Is, is that another alternative that we could look at? There are many right. tools. There are many alternatives, but nobody actually that runs housing or public housing as, as best as the public housing authorities. For example, we actually have a lot of programs. So we have Section 8 vouchers that okay. we, we interact with our private landlords. We actually work with developers that actually we embed part of our, our vouchers, what we call project-based vouchers, so vouchers actually stay in units. So we work with developers. So uh, there are many different tools, but the problem is we still have this capital backlog, and no private investor is going to come in and just take care of it. Um, we do actually recalibrate and redevelop some of our units. We, we take tax credits. So we're using all the tools in, you know, at our disposal to maintain and serve this population that, that needs the housing. Thank you. I, and I'll just volunteer in terms of the how we got here, because it's a good question, Reps of Dotsa. But the shortest answer is in the Reagan administration, we had massive, massive cuts to public housing, and the federal government has never pulled their weight since then. Um, and so that's how we got here. Um, and taking in investment at the state level seriously in public housing is how we build our way out of it. Um, Lee Johnson. Uh, Chair Howard, Representative Hassan, I understand what you're trying to do here. Um, I guess this question is for the uh, director. Um, Minneapolis, let's see, it's Minneapolis uh, Public Housing Authority, so it's owned, these buildings are technically owned by the city of Minneapolis? Director. 
thank you, uh, Representative Johnson, uh, Chair Howard. Um, we own these buildings. So the buildings are owned. It's like a quasi-government agency. We own the buildings. Um, MPHA is responsible for the buildings, and we follow federal regulations. Lee Johnson. Yeah. Uh, Chair Howard and the director again. Uh, how many units does uh, MPHA actually have? 6,000. 6,000 units? Yes. 28,000 people that we serve every day uh, f through all our programs. So public housing, our voucher program, and our, uh, and our now nonprofit type of converted properties as well. Lee Johnson. Uh, Chair Howard, uh, Representative Hassan, I'm not sure if you're aware but there's recently a court ruling where these buildings owned by a nonprofit don't have to pay property tax. Um, they're, they're still working some of the details out of that. So these citizens aren't, uh, so they're not paying property tax, 6,000, what was it, 28,000 units. Now this is state tax dollars. It's the, the people's dollars that we're talking about. Um, yes, is public housing needed? In some areas it is. Mm -hmm. But we have areas all across the state where it, where it needs housing. But we have private owners that have houses in rough shape and they can't get the money to do it as well. And I don't think if Minneapolis public housing is a technically a agency of the city of Minneapolis, I have a tough time having the people from Roseau pay for the public housing in Minneapolis. Um, I'm sh I see that there is a need there, but I'm concerned where we're, last year we gave $1.12 billion that was available to nonprofits for these things, uh, for different programs. And there's a lot of, there's six, there are 28,000 units that have been taken out of the private market and turned into government owned buildings and units. Hmm. I have a lot of concern where this is heading, where it's government run for everything, the government telling us where we live, the government telling us where we go. Uh, there's talk on uh, some of the Bitcoin stuff and the electronic currency where 15 to 20 miles outside where you live, you, you won't be able to use it. Mm. I don't think that's gonna happen, but that's talk that's out there and it's a concern. Um, and we have an issue, we, we don't have the funds to do 35 million. There's needs all over the state with just $10 million. Um, so I think, I, I give the mayor credit, they stepped up with 5 million. But at the time the city actually was running it then when they went backwards, the federal government in every department of this state has never lived up to their responsibilities what they said they would do. In fact, in our schools, which uh, are gonna be hurting next year uh, with, with what was done last year, uh, with the gap funding, the federal government's supposed to pay 40%, and they pay about 19. So we got to figure out a way how the city of Minneapolis is going to make up this difference, whether they start selling off some of these units to private investors. Uh, we're looking at the um, assets, getting loans to take care of the issues. There's many different options besides coming, running to the taxpayers all the time to take care of your problems. But like I say, I understand there is a need. How do we do it? we have to look at all options on the table without uh, just breaking the backs of the taxpayer because we're looking at probably having deficits next year. So we have to be careful how we spend our money. But, but I understand the need. Representative Hassan, you get the final word. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, committee members, for the discussion. Um, I'm just going to highlight that this bill is important for many reasons. and. Uh, the biggest one is that our families deserve to live in a dignified, safe housing. Um, if we, you know, throw blame around and say it's the feds that's supposed to take care of it, it's city of Minneapolis that's supposed to take care of it, it's the state, um, 
these families don't care who takes care of it. Somebody has to take care of it because when you have uh, a family of five and you're living paycheck to paycheck, you don't want to live in a uh, leaky roof and, and, you know, windows that the draft is coming in and your, you know, heating bill is in the thousands. And that's the reality of some of these families. Thank you for the discussion and I hope we can support this bill. Thank you, Representative Hassan. With that, I'll renew the motion that House Bill 4169 be laid over for possible inclusion mm -hmm. in an omnibus bill. And now we'll go to House File 5133. And I'll move that House File 5133 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Hassan, uh, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm back again. Um, <laughs> House File. Um, 5133 appropriates $1.5 million one time for Urban League Twin Cities uh, for the African American uh, Community Land Trust funds. And this funds to be used uh, to acquire new properties for the land trust and rehabilitate the properties included in the land trust. Uh, as you guys know, Urban League uh, Twin Cities was founded in 1928 as one of the Urban Leagues in the United States. For more than 90 years, Urban League uh, Twin Cities has been a source of strength in the community, helping African descendants strive for and achieve economic empowerment, self-sufficient, uh, to build generational wealth. Uh, ULTC formed its Wealth Development Department with a goal um, with a goal of asset building through home ownership, the program employs comprehensive strategies and services to help clients control spending, save money, reduce debt, and build um, credit. Uh, a key part of this is the African American Community Land Trust, which focuses on creating opportunities for affordable and sustainable home ownership within the African American community. By preserving land, housing, um, and housing, ULTC strives to contract gentrification and ensure that long-lasting residents have access to housing that remain affordable. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I have a couple testifiers and we'll stand for questions. First up, we have Al Flowers. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Flowers. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Howard. Uh, uh, thank you for, well, I don't need to say nothing because Representative O'Dan laid it out. Uh, it, it's an important, <laughs> it's a important uh, issue in our community about this African-American community land trust. You know, uh, this country was built on land trusts, uh, but we didn't get to participate in that part when they were divvying up the land. So I, 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 I would uh, say we, uh, we got a, a PowerPoint that Representative Hodan uh, said of uh, our co uh, collaboration, the City of Lake co uh, Community Land Trust, the Urban League, and the community. So we got a, a, pre a presentation that we can uh, send. The state has already uh, uh, invested a, a half a million dollars into this endeavor of uh, what we're doing, and, uh, and now we're asking for the 1.5 to buy uh, more uh, properties. Uh, to help with home buyer uh, uh, assistance and, and doing it from our community uh, perspective. And so uh, that this is something that we came up with, wondering why couldn't we uh, uh, with, uh, have a land trust in our community that could help uh, home ownership and in perpetuity. The, the land trust, because the price stays the same, we're, uh, we're the lowest on the total pole when you look up the ha uh, housing uh, we like uh, it's uh, 25 to 75. Uh, uh, we 75 percent renters in uh, around the uh, state, uh, especially in Minneapolis, uh, in St. Paul. So that's what that's what I'm uh, here for. Hoping y'all support this initiative uh, and support it because we're coming as an African American community. We have well, got the right partners. The city of Lake, who's built on a land trust, uh, and and uh, Twin City Urban League. Uh, that we can uh, do this together. And uh, you, uh, Representative Howard, I, I met with you. It's an important issue. You gave us some good advice. I want to thank you for that. Uh, but we can, uh, the best advice is that we can get a little more into the pot uh, to do this land trust. And so that's why we're asking for the 1.5 million. And, and, uh, and I'll turn it over to uh, 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 Thomas Berry with Black Civic Network. Mr. Berry, welcome to the committee. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, your time. I apologize, I'm not dressed well. I was at home working on some things. 
Uh, but with that being said, I do believe that it is important uh, with the land trust when you talk about legacy programs, Section 8 and the other subsidized housing have become legacy programs for our community and it has us at the bottom when it comes to this state when we talk about home ownership. Compared to our white counterparts who own 77.4%, uh, we only own 30.5% of homes in the country uh, in the state lowest or one of the, some of the lowest in the country i think wisconsin may be lower than us uh, our community uh, as you know over 600,000 people throughout the state use over 30 percent of their income just to pay for rent we know that that's not sustainable we also know that that makes that that ownership gap uh, wider we're not asking uh, for something that we see as a bad investment, the great thing about the land trust is that you can pass that down for generations. So it's a great legacy program considered uh, when you compare that to Section 8. So we feel like this would be a great investment in the state. We also feel like this would be a great investment for the community. So our um, children will know what it's like to actually own homes. They can actually graduate out the program and get into more conventional style home ownership. But it is something that can be passed on and it could be a great legacy starter. Thank you. Thank you. And last, we have Alicia Smith with the City of Lakes Land Trust. Uh, she's oh. not, she's not here. Okay. Anyone else who would like to testify? If not, we'll go to member questions. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess a question for the chair first. Uh, what What did this organization receive last year in your omnibus bill? I think it was. I want to say it's like over a million dollars. Maybe mm. Representative Hassan knows. Was there any appropriation? I don't believe so. No, I don't believe so, no. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. He was mistaken to send to them. Well, it was a big bill, a billion dollars. <laughs> 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 no. Not big problem? enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Randall Land Trust, maybe. Oh, maybe it's the Randall. Yeah. Randall Land Ran Trust. Randall Land Trust, right. that's different. <laughs> that's St. Paul. I just wanted to ask before I preface any questions, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let others go. But, uh, you know, once again, we've got 10, 10 million in, you can spend on the tails. A million. Um, I, I'm just trying to level set expectations. Other questions from members? If not, we'll go to Representative Hassan for the final word. You guys are making it very easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. You still got a bill left. Uh, Nash, you don't got more questions? <laughs> Would you like some? Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> okay. no I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, you know, I have served housing for six years, and that whole six years I've talked about the importance of home ownership. I should have an award in my head that says champion for home ownership uh, because we all know that home ownership is, is a generational wealth building. It's about stability. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I said, in America, if you don't own something, you are nobody because no one will lend to you. No one will give you anything. Um, so, you know, having a bill like this is super important because it's the voices of the community coming to the table and saying, hey, um, we have a partnership from different organizations and we really want this funding. So um, that's why I brought this bill and that's why I think this bill is important. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And with that, the bill is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. One more Representative Hassan bill, House File 5043. And I'll move that House File 5043 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Have at it. All right, Mr. Chair, I promise this is my last bill. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chair. House File uh, 5043 appropriates $1 million uh, one time funding to Turning Point Inc. for renovating and rehabilitating supportive and residential housing. Turning Point has been uh, providing chemical uh, health treatment services, housing supportive services, and job training for people with substance use disorder since 1976. And um, this funding will be used, uh, so there's two organizations in here, Turning Point and uh, Ms. B's House. Ms. B's House is uh, uh, supportive housing. When people go to Turning Point and they complete their treatment for 90 days or so, um, they, they go to Ms. B's house for supportive housing until they can get, you know, uh, either low-income housing or other uh, affordable housing. And this funding is for that specific reason is to, um, you know, use existing uh, housing that um, this specific organization has to 
uh, renovate and keep up with uh, maintenance. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I have a testifier and we'll stand for questions. Hello, Lori Wilson. Uh, yes. Welcome to the committee. State your name and, um, uh, and share your testimony with us. Thank you, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Chair, Representative Hassan. My name is Lori Wilson. I am the uh, newly appointed CEO at Turning Point. Um, as Representative Hassan has uh, stated, we have been in the business since 1976. Uh, our business is to help and heal individuals, right? And so what we're asking for is help, right? We're looking at an, a building that was built in 1987. It has minimum um, repairs on it since it's been built, but we've had some extensive um, damage to it over the years. Um, the building is for our supportive housing. We've got uh, different services within, and, and Representative Hassan has, has stated that. We've got housing. Our main purpose in this world is to help individuals through their recovery. This building is to help 32 men uh, every day go through their recovery. And so what we're looking for are repairs for the house. Um, we're looking for uh, extensive repairs on the kitchen. It, it's, it seems kind of minimal, but there's a lot of space in this house. And so we're looking at um, roof repairs, uh, repairs to the restrooms, repairs to the kitchen, repairs to the overall space. The space um, will include, what we're looking to do is um, be a little more inclusive so they can, they can have a better recovery, so they can meet with one another and meet with community leaders. And so it's very important to the community and to our, uh, our clients to have a, a better space to live in. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to testify? If not, we'll go to member discussion. Representative Dotson. Thank you, Chair Howard, uh, Representative Hassan. Um, here we go again. I, I appreciate what you, uh, what you do for uh, uh, taking care of so many great individuals. Uh, the question I've got, though, I, I keep seeing, it's like Groundhog Day over and over, where it's uh, repairs and maintenance for uh, these facilities, an ongoing process. Is there a budget set, and set aside? Uh, has there been one since, was it 1976? Uh, to set aside monies for future repairs, maintenance, and I'll just go one step further. Once you receive, if you receive these monies, is there a plan uh, to be account of uh, what's going to be done with those monies? Yeah. Uh, Representative Hassan or uh, Ms. Wilson? Ms. Wilson. Great question. Thank you, Representative. Um, honestly, there was no budget for it earlier on, and so now we're looking at doing different actually diversifying our budget you know we've we've depended heavily on the state for programming we've pretended depended heavily on the county and the city and so we're looking at private funds we're looking at um, trying to raise money to make sure that we are sustainable um, I think the main reason and the and well the main reason that I'm coming into this space is to make sure that we are sustainable uh, we haven't had that kind of um, wherewithal to make sure that we have money put aside. And so we're working with different indiv individuals, entities, community leaders, community um, organizations to make sure that we are placing ourselves in a better space going forward. President Dotson. Thank you, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Chair Howard. So what I'm hearing you say that there's been no money set aside since 1970 for mid-76 uh, for uh, future repairs. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Well, I would say they were doing minor, mi minor repairs throughout the years, right? And so now we're trying to actually make the building sustainable and make sure that they're good. Now we've got funding from the city that we've got. Um, last year we got money from the state last year for our other buildings just to make sure that we're good going forward. Our programming, um, we've got some different budgeting from uh, the county, uh, making sure that we have program money so that we're not... Um, digging ourselves in a hole again. Representative Dotson. What, what I'm hearing is it's been 40 years, 40 plus years uh, uh, that we're looking at. Um, I guess I just get concerned as why they ask now. Hasn't, why hasn't there been an ask along the, along the process or has there been, and maybe I'm not aware of that. There may have been an ask, to tell you honestly. I don't know that, but, um, and they may not have received it. You know, I, I know that we've had, oh, 
Thank you, Jen. Um, we've had some different, uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> we've had different requests in the past and we haven't received it. And so now, you know, we're, we're in a better space financially to maybe just sustain some of that, but yeah. Do you wanna? And I see Mr. Hayden here. Well, it's good to see you, Mr. Chair. It's good to see all of you here. Um, my name is Jeff Hayden. I work for Fredrickson, and we support uh, Turning Point uh, in this ask. Um, I just want to put a little bit of a context here. We're in the Housing Committee um, because primarily the focus in the repairs that we need to do are on the facilities. However, Turning Point is a treatment program that is about 95 to 98 percent supported by Medicaid. Those are low-income Minnesotans that go there. I think if you spent any time in the health care committee, which I've spent a ton of time in my time being in this body and, and in the other one that we don't talk about, um, <laughs> um, the, the constant in the clarion call is that Medicaid does not cover the cost of care. So you hear that for the treatment. There's an, an SUD proposal in front of you this year. You hear that with the hospitals, rural hospitals and urban hospitals that Medicaid doesn't cover the cost of care. So Turning Point at its core is a treatment center. It's a healthcare facility that also provides housing. So one of the problems that we've had, uh, uh, Representative, and I think it is a great uh, a question, is that um, based on the budget that they got, it was barely enough money in order to give people the care that they need, the health care that they need, much less have an excess amount of money in order to take care of the asset preservation and the deferred maintenance on their facilities. So um, it has come to a point where um, we, just like the university, uh, the state colleges, um, the hospitals all across uh, Minnesota and any other healthcare facility has continued to ask us to help them build or maintain or preserve their assets. That's the same thing that Turning Point is dealing with. Representative Dotson. Thank you, Chair Howard. Uh, appreciate what you do again. Uh, just one final question would be is, uh, Administrative fees, uh, how much do you have for administration uh, as far as overhead, as far as administration? Is there a way that some of that could maybe be condensed or reduced? Ms. Well, Wilson or Mr. Hayden? Well, I, I guess what we'll say is we certainly can get that to you. Our administrative cost is well within um, all of the contracts that we have, mostly Medicaid uh, contracts. So certainly uh, our contracts and the administration is there. But I would remind you, uh, Representative, that we are providing health care. SUD care, um, mental health care, um, and often sometimes direct health care. So we have to make sure that we're competitive and that we can pay the right people uh, to go and do the work uh, to provide the services for very vulnerable people. Thank you. And then, I'll add yes. too that we did reduce our administrative costs 20% last year. Lee Johnson. Uh, Chair Howard, uh, to the testifiers, I want to thank you for the work that you do. Uh, we can work on the addiction, but along with that addiction comes mental health issues. Mm -hmm. If you look at any narcotic, one of the side effects is mental health issues. Um, and it takes years to get over that, if it's even possible. So I want to thank you for the work that you do do. I know I have, and my church works with an organization in my district, um, dealing with those issues. It's group home. Uh, we help them out the best we can. I take it that you have uh, worked and looked into your community to help with funding for some of these projects already, and I ap appreciate that. If you haven't, it's a good place to start because those people want those individuals uh, taken care of as well so they don't, they're not out doing other things causing problems in their community. They'd like to have them healed, and not just on the outside but at the inside as well. So I just want to thank you for the work you do. Representative Hassan, you get the final word. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank oh, you guys. Representative Hassan, I've, I had two members on the list, oh. Representative Perez Vega and Representative Hussein. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. You have plenty of time. Sorry. It's kind of hard to see me back here. Yeah. <laughs> Molly's amazing, but I got to block you. Uh, I just want to say, Molly. you know, um, Rep Hassan, thank you, and thank you for the work that you do in, in particular in North Minneapolis. I know about this organization. Um, in regards to so many folks throughout the years. 
Uh, I come from a family that has had to battle substance abuse, and we know the programs that do work so that we have a collectiveness of community that grow, and a part of that is having, you know, two worlds in one space. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about two worlds in one space is where you have housing and you have treatment programs together so that you're not troubled enough to be able to become you know, the productive citizen, the productive family member, the productivity that we seek for our communities and particularly our black and brown communities that have an ongoing of systemic injustices. And when we talk about housing and treatment in the need, and this is a place that deserves to recognize whether it is the first time or the second time. There needs to be as many times as possible to ensure that there are spaces that are providing what we're seeing a lack of in our communities, whether it's in Minneapolis, whether it's in St. Paul, whether it's in greater Minnesota, but there is a need for cultural competency in particularly when we're serving these communities that face these disparities. And that's what I just wanna <coughs> highlight and thanking you to bring to this bill because these are the avenues of where there are certified programs to get the health, but if you don't have a home, that's an issue. That's a health care issue, mm -hmm. all right? And if you don't have the, the, the sustainability of folks that come from that community that understand whether they have been a survivor or they have survived somebody within their housing has done that, there's a problem if that's not the solution. And so I just wanna say from the case management, to the opportunity to engage in that healthcare services, along with the ability and the capacity to provide employment. These are the sectors that go underneath a roof. So I look forward to uh, supporting this initiative and thank you for the work that you've been doing over North Minneapolis. I'd love to talk about how we can talk about how we can spread that along our metro area. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Hussain. Rep Hassan. Today was your day. You brought a like <laughs> good bills and, and, and thank you for bringing them forward. And I am familiar with uh, Turning Point. I know them for over two decades and I understand that so many people, young, black, brown, has been going there for mental illness and that treatment. And some of them are doing it better now and have a qualified, you know, uh, executive directors and some of them are teachers, some of our mentors in our community. And I wanna thank you for the great work that you guys have been doing it and uh, anything that we could do to help, let us know. Representative Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, Rep. Press Vega and Rep. Hussain just calls it up for me, <laughs> this is a good bill. Um, in, in, in my real world, I am a mental health clinician, so I used to work with people who have addiction and folks who are unhoused and uh, struggling with mental illness. And um, it is important to have a program where they can finish their treatment and not go back to the same environment that got them to where they're at. So having a program that has a treatment and then housing helps that person get their feet on the ground and then stabilize their life a little bit longer than if they just did the program and went back to the community that, that they were in before because who, whatever got you in trouble is still there. You are gonna run into the same friends and same circles and before you know it, you're gonna have a relapse. So having this program that has housing and treatment center is really vital and it's important and that's why I am carrying this bill and I hope you can support, thank you. Thank you, Representative Hassan. With that, uh, I'll renew the motion that House File 5043 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Hassan, thank you for uh, bringing these good bills forward today. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>